Good evening. Welcome to St. James in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. I pray the Lord bless you. This Lenten tide brought you closer to him. Maybe open your eyes to see his incredible, maybe ridiculous grace and mercy for you. Uh, and also, if, if you haven't noticed, there's a theme to these Wednesdays. Places of the Passion, looking at different places, spaces where Christ was and how they uh, impact the action, what happened, etc. So let us uh, continue. Please rise. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the land. It is good to give thanks to the Lord. To herald your love in the morning. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and one another. We have been free to do so. I confess to God Almighty before the whole company of heaven and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned in thought, word, and deed, that I, by my fault, by my own fault, by my own most grievous fault. Wherefore, I pray God Almighty to have mercy on me, forgive me all my sins, and bring me to everlasting life. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you forgiveness and remission of all your sins. Amen.
The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 26th chapter. While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I kiss is the man, seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Into your hands, O Lord, I command my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Heavenly Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Have you ever felt real, actual betrayal? I pray that you haven't, but maybe there's been a time in your life where you have trusted someone and felt really that you could put your confidence in them only to find out that you couldn't or maybe that you shouldn't. Betrayal shocks us to our very core. I was recently reading a book on marriage counseling, and in this book they talked about how betrayals uh, in a marriage relationship are so shocking, people often deny that it's even happening. They'll see their spouse on a date, perhaps, with someone else, and think, strange, that looks just like my spouse. It couldn't possibly be them, and so our brain sorts it into a different category, denies it altogether because we are not equipped to handle betrayal. And yet tonight, we talk about the Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane is located on the Mount of Olives. We talked about that last week. Jesus would go to this place to pray, to find refuge. We are told that he would go there frequently. So there was a sense that this is a place of safety for Jesus and for the disciples. But the most remarkable thing is that the Garden of Gethsemane is marked by betrayal. That's the key theme when we think about this garden. Jesus' arrest and his betrayal. Think about how shocking this particular betrayal, of all betrayals, would have been. When we break bread with one another, we form fellowship. We form bonds of trust and friendship with the people around us. How many times had Judas broken bread with Jesus? Hundreds of times, perhaps? And yet after all those hours of fellowship, of camaraderie, of brotherhood, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Judas comes to betray Jesus with an army of soldiers at his back along with the high priests and the Pharisees. And to add insult to injury, Judas identifies Jesus with the kiss of peace, with this friendship marker. How would you react to this kind of betrayal, to this kind of hurt? Would you react with anger? Would you react with hatred? Would you react with heartbreak? All of those things are justifiable reactions to this kind of event. But the disciples themselves don't fare much better than Judas, comparing the two groups, right? The disciples, in their own way, also betray Jesus, just like Judas does. Twice Jesus has to awaken Peter, James, and John from slumber. Watch and pray so that you do not fall into temptation, Jesus says. But Peter indeed falls into temptation as he denies not just knowing Jesus, but ever knowing Jesus with his threefold denial. Peter's reaction to Judas's betrayal is probably a little bit like our own. He has righteous indignation here. He takes up the sword to defend Jesus from Jesus's adversaries and cuts off the ear of a servant named Malchus. Maybe we see ourselves in Peter instead of in Judas. We want to defend Jesus from his adversaries, to defend the church from those things that assail it. But is this what Jesus wants? Paradoxically, Jesus remains the Lord of life, the one who forgives sins, even here in the garden. Jesus rebukes Peter in a parallel account and miraculously heals this servant's ear. Jesus experiences the deepest kind of betrayal, and he, even now, restores what's broken. He reconciles. He restores what's broken for this person, and he restores what's broken for you and I as well. While we seek to get even or to get angry when it comes to betrayal, Jesus responds only with self-sacrificial love and compassion. What's interesting is witnessing this miracle seems to have no particular effect on this crowd. They continue on with what they're going to do as they seek to put the Lord of life to death on a cross. And as they take Jesus away to go before Pontius Pilate, we read that the disciples, all, every single one of them, scatter away from Christ for fear of their lives. All of them. 
every single disciple betrays Jesus in some way. None of that dissuades Jesus from what he's about to do. None of that turns him aside. Jesus knows that we who are bound to sin are unable to remain faithful to the end. We can't run the course all the way to the finish line. Instead, we must be liberated by Jesus Christ, who even now is our sacrificial Passover lamb. And this most important fact is at the core of tonight's reading. Our betrayal doesn't change Jesus. In fact, our betrayal is only countered by Jesus' willingness to suffer and die in our place, to pay the penalty for our sin, and to restore faithfulness. God made him who knew no sin to become sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. Nothing will stop our Savior from this great exchange wherein Jesus is, yes, put to death, but we, in fact, receive the crown of life in his place. I'm reminded of the Old Testament prophet Hosea. Hosea, if we remember our Old Testament narrative, was called by God to marry and be faithful to Gomer, who was a prostitute. Hosea knows the task that's in front of him. It's going to be filled with heartbreak and betrayal, if ever there was some. And yet Hosea does this nonetheless. As God is betrothed forever to Israel, this unfaithful spouse, he will redeem her at any cost. Same goes for Hosea. Hosea outbids everyone else and purchases Gomer back and restores her faithfulness. How does this kind of love that purchases back, that buys back and restores, change how you see betrayal. You see, God has spent far more than silver or gold on you. God has spent the precious lifeblood of his only son, our Lord Jesus Christ. He ransomed you back from far more than servitude. He purchased you back from sin, death, and everlasting condemnation. How does God respond to betrayal? He responds with all-encompassing love, specifically the all-encompassing love of Jesus Christ. Whilst we seek to get angry or to get even, God doesn't. He doesn't ignore the sin either, but instead he does something far greater by sending his son, Jesus Christ, the great reconciler, into our midst so that we might have eternal life and light would be brought out of the darkest corners of our existence. In Jesus, the God-man, God and man are now reconciled, and our unfaithfulness and betrayal is replaced by Jesus's perfect faithfulness unto the end. So how do we now respond to betrayal? How do we respond to brokenness? We don't paper over it. We look at a sin for what it is. We call a spade a spade. That's true. And yet even in the midst of life's darkest moments, we can look to the example of Jesus Christ. This Jesus heals and restores in the midst of betrayal and brokenness. He gives forgiveness even to turncoats. May we be empowered and emboldened by the example of Jesus Christ to love and to forgive those whom Jesus has placed into our lives, knowing that Jesus Christ has first loved and forgiven us. And when we feel that our forgiveness ultimately isn't enough, we rest knowing that the forgiveness that Jesus provides is perfect even when ours is not. This is the forgiveness that Jesus prays for in the Garden of Gethsemane. This is the forgiveness that he wins and accomplishes for us on the cross, and this is the forgiveness that he distributes within the church free of charge each and every week as his word is proclaimed and his sacraments are administered. Amen. Now may the peace that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let us praise our Lord, worship him with our best in our offerings.
us rise and pray. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Keep me as the apple of your eye. In righteousness I shall see you. Almighty God, move our hearts to repentance and reception of your forgiveness and move us to give out forgiveness to those who are on our minds, who have hurt us, who we are angry at, we can't stop thinking about. Give us that ability of forgiveness, drawing it from the immeasurable forgiveness we have in you, Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, bless our journey to Easter as we learn more and more and remember and hear the same old thing more and more, and dwell upon more and more what your Son did for us, gave to us, and help us to find rest in his words from the cross and the empty tomb. It is finished. Have no fear. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, be with those who are sick among us, who are troubled, who are worried, frustrated. We pray for those dealing with physical illness. We pray for those who are dealing with mental illness, broken relationships, and those who mourn. We pray for them, but also, Lord, move us to serve them, to see them. And we pause now and we lift up to you in our hearts those people on our, on our minds that need your intervention. We lift them up to you. Pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Guide us, waking, O Lord, and guard us, sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in.
The Almighty and Merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. <laughs>